he came forth in prophetic utterance. And he came forth as his own Holy Ghost. His own resurrected spirit. And thank God he told John, said, look, behold, I come quickly. Somebody say praise the Lord. And I like what Brother House said. If somebody tells you that he's going to come. And about 2,000 years later, in your opinion, he still ain't come. Just don't wait for him no more. But if you got enough sense to believe and know this morning that he who said he was coming about 10 days afterward did come. Somebody say amen. And he has come ever since. Praise the Lord. And so the word in the book of Revelation was not only is he coming, but he cometh. And that means in the continuous phrase, he's always coming. He's always manifesting. He's always showing up. He's come 20 times in this week this morning. Amen. But praise God, you've got all this running around. And everybody said, what are you doing? Well, I'm waiting. What are you waiting on? I'm waiting on the coming of the Lord. I'm waiting on the Lord's return. Well, I'll tell you, the coming of the Lord isn't a blessed hope. It's a blessed fact. He's already come. He shall continue to come. He ain't never going to quit coming. But I'll tell you now how he ain't coming. He ain't coming in flesh and blood. He ain't coming in a five foot eight body. He ain't coming in the frame of a natural man. But he's coming forth in glory. And he's coming forth in power. And he's coming forth in spirit. For God is a what? Spirit. And they that worship him must do so in the spirit and in the truth. Praise God. Hallelujah. Well, I haven't just really set out to teach the book of Revelation, but it sure seems like I have been, but I didn't on purpose. I started out talking about uh, well, I wanted to work to the 8th chapter of the book of Revelation. And in the 8th chapter of the book of Revelation, which has been our golden brackets, have been set there ever since last Sunday morning, <laughs> For the Lord said that at the loosening of the seventh seal, there is silence in the space of heaven for about a half an hour. And after this silence, we're told that there are awaiting seven angels with seven trumpets in their hand. But because of what's going on at the moment, they cannot utter a sound. And the activity that follows is that there comes an angel having a golden censer or vial full of odors, which are the prayers of the saints. Amen. And he, the Bible says that another angel, glory to God, yes. and that's Jesus, another angel comes forth and takes these prayers over to the altar of incense and adds the incense of heaven yes. to the prayers of the saints yes. and offers it on the golden altar of incense. And the smoke begins to rise up and ascend. Right. Oh, hallelujah. hallelujah. <laughs> Glory to God. The smoke begins to ascend. Hallelujah. Or our prayers in a heavenly realm begin to come together with His Word and intercession. And the Bible says that the Lord takes then a coal from off of the altar, a fiery coal, a living coal. Praise God. The finished work. And he puts it uh, with these prayers and then casts it back into the earth. Glory to God. So that when it comes out of our mouth, Amen. Hallelujah. He casts it into the earth. So that when it comes forth through us, it's lively. It's on fire. It speaks of the finished work. 
It's the fulfillment of Romans, the 8th chapter, when we know not how we ought to pray, but the Spirit Himself maketh intercessions for us with groaning such as cannot be uttered. And I've simply been just calling this kingdom praying. But we we really ended up in a whole discourse on the book of Revelation that God has marvelously revealed truths to us line by line. And so I'm, I'm not going to break the flow that he does, and I don't believe he has. But I, we, we've been covering, I mean, we've been covering everything. We've done come from the second chapter all the way to the sixth chapter, and this morning we're going to discuss the seventh chapter of the book of Revelation. Amen. And so we've come through, uh, let's go through just shortly what we went through Wednesday night. Because in Wednesday night we covered the, the loosening of six of the seals. Remember that? And the first four seals, every time one of them was loose. Now remember, we're the, the, that, that book is us. Yes, that yes. scroll is us. Yes. Yes, sir. Right? Yes. Because we read in the, in the uh, fifth chapter that John's weeping. And he can't quit weeping. And he can't quit weeping because there ain't been one found in heaven or earth that can open that book can loose them seals. He can't be all heavenly and not earthly. And he can't be all earthly and not heavenly. So we got to find one who's both. Heaven and earth. And heaven and earth can only meet together in one man. And that one man is the Lord from heaven, Jesus who said no man has ascended into heaven except he which had come from heaven and is standing in heaven right now. Amen. Amen. So we, then, then when John does dry his tears, what made him dry his tears? He heard a voice yes. that said, John, weep not. This is all the fifth chapter. For we found one worthy. And the book that he's opening is these books. Right here. I'm opening up the books of life that all truth may be told. Remember that song we sing? It's a sure word yet unwritten that the prophets did withhold. But it's a word that will resurrect the dead. You see, as before the seed they stand, my judgment and my mercy seat will bring forth this corporate man. We don't sing these songs just to make music. They got a word in them. Amen, I'm opening the books of life and we're those books. Amen. And we have many secrets and mysteries and revelations sealed up in us. Not that somebody has to come give us, but that somebody please come help us turn them loose. Yes, Lord. We're like the fellow that's in the Louisiana and he conquered and tackled one of those wild cougar cats. And a man was walking through the stick marsh and heard this guy screaming out, help me. And he got over there to where the guy was and he had wrestled him down, was laying on top of him, holding him. And that guy walking said, hey, hey there. He said, you want me to help you hold him? He said, no, I want somebody to help me turn him loose. Amen. And I want you to know that's the way we are with what's in us. We don't need nobody to help us hold it. We need somebody to help us turn it loose. Now we've had the Lord turn it loose in us, but we was afraid to speak out what He said because it was so different from what we had been led to believe and what we had been taught to believe. So now the Lord is sending us ministries and voices and prophetic utterances and helps along the way. The Bible said God put helps and governments didn't He in the church. And some of that help we're getting is help to have the, the, the tenacity to believe that what God has invested in us is truth. And it is life. And it is the word of the Lord. So we're turning it loose. Only to find out that in the when the seals were broken, the first four, there was four horses. And on those horses, horsemen. And the first one was white, and the second one was red, and the third one was black, and the fourth one was, was pale, or should have been green. What pale means green. It's, amen. And the first horse comes forth right, it ain't a Geronimo horse, it's not a real horse, it's not, this is symbolism. It's not a real horse, it's not a, uh, the color, don't even mean the color white. White means bright light, it means the shining one, glory to God. And there's a bright and 
a shining light that is rolled forth out of our earth, has shined in our earth. And we talked about all those good scriptures arise and shine, you know, for your light is come. And so, secondly, the horse was red which talks about that vehement flaming fire of the Holy Ghost that has come into our earth. And bless God, He's riding through and He's disturbing peace. He's taking our peace away. We can't find any peace in the earth realm anymore. The only peace we have is in Him. Hallelujah. The only life we found is in Him. He's the only reason I live. And oh, what a reason. Amen. And then thirdly, the black horse comes and we don't think about that black horse being can do anything good for us. But we know that when it was black and when it was dark in the earth, the Spirit of the Lord began to move on the face of the water. Hallelujah. And light shone out of darkness. And the Bible teaches us that the greatest darkness can cause the light of this new day to spring forth and inhabit our being and cause us to be enlightened and flooded with light of revelation of the goodness of God. And, then, right. and these are brief reviews. You can get the CD, but the fourth and final horse was the most powerful. He was pale. He was green. And when he rode forth in his eternal realm of life, Glory. all the death and all the hell that existed in us had to follow him out of there. He, he led it. He led captivity captive. Hallelujah. He said, I have the key of death and of hell. Hallelujah. And he has ridden through our earth and bound up death and bound up hell and caused it to follow him. And you say, oh, have you got any Bible for that? I sure do. He said, hallelujah, that himself spoiled principality and power and made a show of them openly, triumphing over them. He, he, he led it captive. He rose through our earth and every bit of that death realm had to come in alignment and march out of there with him because Jesus said I laid upon his shoulder the key of David hallelujah and he has caused that life to conquer death glory amen the, the fifth seal that was loosed was the moving back of the altar everybody say the altar and under the altar was found the souls of men and these men were not just any men. They were martyred men. Yes. They were the dead in Christ. Yes. They were the witnesses of the testimony that there was an overcoming life. And they cry out day and night, How long, O oh Lord, before we see this message come forth? How long, O oh Lord, before we see all death destroyed? How long, O oh Lord? I'm going to tell you what, you better be under that order crying out this morning. How long under the breakthrough? How long until we see it happen? How long until we see all things conquered? Why? Because you must have faith in your heart to believe that even right here in this hour, when there's a noise going on all around you, there is a voice down inside of your soul that says, this ain't the way it ends. This isn't the way it's going to be. God is changing this thing. The martyr's voice. He loses that seal so we can cry that. And finally that sixth seal let loose and when it did, it was, oh, it was noisy. It was noisy because there was a heaven realm and an earth realm that had to pass away. Yes. All the mountains had to move. And God dug up every one of them islands that's planted herself out there under that sea and said, we don't need the body. Right. The preacher better than you're shouting now. Right. All these people that are doing their own thing and saying they're going to manifest sonship while they're running around doing their own thing. Honey, the Lord said, I'm going to remove your islands. I'm going to float you right back where you belong. Amen. All right. Amen. Hey, let me give you, a, let me give you a, a good common way to look at that so you can relate to it. You'll probably have to move over. Somebody might want to set by you. Yeah. Right. Yes. One of them islands gets around and they, they, hallelujah, you may be worshiping the Lord in here one day and somebody poke you in the yeah. shoulder oh, yeah. and you turn around to see somebody who called they'd never need you again. And they want to know, can I sit with you? And don't you dare say anything unless you're going to say, uh, Hello, Island, we've been waiting on you. 
come on in the mountain for you. All an island is is a distorted mountain. Pieces of the mountain that it broke off and moved their own way. And tried to plant their roots so that they couldn't be moved. Amen. How many believes this preaching this morning? And then he said, hallelujah, that, that uh, he talks about the uh, fig tree drying up. Oh, Jesus cursed the fig tree. Everybody knows what that is. That's a passing away. He said, I'm taking that kingdom out of your hands. And I'm giving it over into the hands of a new generation. Amen. And I want to stop and say right here that this church does not believe the Jews any different than the Gentiles. Amen. We believe all are one in Christ Jesus. Amen. We do not preach that because you're born in a certain nation or because you're born under some pedigree of earth that you have special blessing factors that other people don't have. No, sir. Every Jew is as equal as the Gentile and vice versa. And the only way you can get in this kingdom is by the door, which is Jesus Christ. And they will come in the same way we came in. Not because they were born to an earthly house, but because they were born of the Spirit of God and declared that Jesus Christ was Lord. Amen. So you can save your money and quit planting trees in Israel. That ain't going to help your soul. You can quit, hello church, you can quit all of that listening to all them preachers and they just absolutely talk about all this. They just absolutely bring their church under an Israeli covering. Thinking that natural country is going to get them some special blessing from God. They have the prayer shawls and they blow the children on it. Preacher better than you're shouting now. And, I, and it's getting quieter by the seconds. They have the seed plan. And they have the tree company. Say amen. amen. I'm just telling you now that that ain't going to help you spiritually. The only way them people, are they awful? No, they're wonderful people. And their heritage is beautiful. But it won't outlive the door to the sheepfold. And the door to the sheepfold is the Lord Jesus Christ. And that fig tree that ain't got no fruit on it is cursed either way, whether he's a Jew or a Gentile. But there is a vine and some branches. Glory be to God. Somebody say praise the Lord. And even in that vine that they didn't count us as anything, we became a wild branch. That was what? Grafted in. And there's only two times that word is used in the Bible, and that's Romans 11 and James 1. In Romans 11, said thou being a wild branch were grafted in, but if the root be holy, so are the branches. And James the first chapter said, laying apart all superfluity and all of the flesh, let us receive with meekness the engrafted word of God, which is able to save our souls. Somebody say that. Jesus Glory. said the axe has been laid to the root of the tree. That natural way is not the way anymore. It was a top and shadow up the way, but it's not the way anymore. But Jesus said, I am the way. I am the truth. I am the life. Hallelujah. And no man coming to the Father but by me. Amen. That's the sixth here. Now then, we go to the seventh chapter of the book of Revelation and find out, oh, hallelujah. We find out about some more people. A different breed of people. A different kind of people. The sixth, uh, sixth seal has been loosed. And we're in between the loosening of the sixth and the seventh seal. And six is the number of man. And from what I can read in the sixth chapter, I must believe that God brought it in to something. That's right. He brought an end to a round. And it is with this that I think we need to do a little preaching to you right here and kind of tell you why, just why it is that we don't believe in a traditionalism, futuristic view concerning the book of Revelation. You can't believe in one and read thoroughly this seventh chapter. Let me tell you why. It has been taught for years by the, as Brother Barner said, the three blind mice, uh, Schofield and Darby, and uh, 
uh, largely that they are the ones that introduce dispensationalism. Dispensationalism is a teaching that God has errors of time. He has a people in every area that he loves, wants to redeem, but at the end of a certain time, if they don't do, do, do what he wants them to do, he'll just cut off the whole flock and move on and start a new era of time. For this, they teach seven dispensations. They teach dispensation of conscience and grace and whatever. And in accordance with their teaching, we're in the dispensation of the Gentiles, which is culminated and closed with what they call the rapture of the church. And, and when they say rapture of the church, they don't mean what we'd mean that word to mean around here. We believe that word to mean caught up in the Holy Ghost, lost in the Spirit, Amen. lifted up into Him. Glory. But they believe putting on wings and flying out through the atmosphere somewhere and chasing stars and hunting spaceships and waving at your loved ones when you go by and bypassing a hole in the heart of the earth called hell and going up into the... I'm just telling you, that's what they believe I'm not saying I'm not saying anything about it, but I'm just telling you why we don't believe that way. Because first of all, this body right here ain't going to go up sailing through the clouds. This is flesh and bone right here. Praise God. Even Mary Poppins needed an umbrella. Amen. <laughs> and besides that, their teachings are relevant. They teach you when people take off up yonder, they're not going to have no clothes on. They do. They say we're going to go in there and find our loved one's clothes laying on the floor. How many of you have heard that story before? About the poor old man goes to honey his wife in bed at night, and there she's missing, but her gown's laying. Never did get the purpose of that, but her gown's laying there in the bed. Shoes is on the bed. My God help us. We're, they, do you really believe they believe that people's going to go off no clothes? No, you know that because they teach clothesline religion, so they sure can't believe that. They're confused. They don't know what they believe. They contradict themselves, and we're walking in a way where the Bible don't contradict itself, but it speaks to us about an overcoming people in this earth who will inherit all things in God. Amen. So the God is not the author of confusion. And a lot of what I was taught to believe has confusion in it. For that reason, 90% of Pentecostals won't even read the book of Revelation. They don't even open it to the book. If you try to talk to them about Revelation, you know what they'll say? I can't understand nothing in there. I don't know nothing about that. You know why? Because you were in the same boat I was in. I heard all that stuff and, and it just wasn't coming in alignment and I left it alone. And if you'll leave it alone, let the Lord do the opening of the seal. He'll reveal to you and tell you that it ain't a book about practice. It ain't a book about serpents. It ain't a book about the devil. It ain't in a book about wars and famine. It is the unveiling of the persona of man so that we can see him in his glory, in his power, and in his majesty. Glory. Now, let's get back to that teaching. I'll try not to be a smart aleck again. When that the uh, uh, teaching goes that in the close of the Gentile age, God's done with everybody. He's mad with everybody. The only people he ain't mad at is the Christians. And the only reason he ain't mad at them is because they repent every Sunday. <laughs> now, if I'm right so far, guess not your head. You don't have to be counted, but nod your head. Amen. Then the uh, fact is that God's so mad and so furious that he turns against this earth that he created. I'm glad we're recording this. Somebody ought to hear that. That he created and said that it was G O O D good. And on the third day, he said it twice that it was good. And turning against that man that he created, that he said was good and never took it back. He never said man was naked. And when man said he was, he asked him, who told you that? Yes, he did. Lord, I'm going to shout this morning. I'm going to tell you now I'm on my way to a Jubilee right here in the oh, service this morning. Because oh, I know where I'm going with this thing. I'm going to prove to you once and for all man can't get it right. 
Hallelujah. Right. Only that's right. The rest of it is just hearsay. That he and, and then after he turns on that earth and that creation, he's going to get so violently angry with it that he's going to have to gather up them few people he is happy with and snatch them away and hide them over there somewhere because he don't want them to see just how destructive and demolishing he can be. Although he said it was his and he said it was good and he said it was in his image and his likeness and after his own nature. Do you not understand that to believe that theory would to believe that God can turn on Himself? Right. And so, I had trouble. And because I had troubles, I just didn't think about it. Maybe that's how the Lord could help me with some of these things. I just refused to think about it because I'll tell you, I'd have had a hard time serving a God who said he loved me, but every minute was hunting some way to cut me off and kill me and destroy me. Do you understand where I'm going with this thing? And so, the Pentecostals adapted a Roman doctrine that was not taught by any of our forefathers until 1830s. Now, you got your listening ears on? Peter didn't teach it. John didn't teach it. Paul didn't teach it. Paul sure didn't teach it. Are you listening to me? But the Roman church in the 1800s, the men who got to preaching started to expose the doctrines of Babylon that were in the Roman church system. One of the doctrines was that the Pope who ruled Rome was of the Antichrist spirit. And when they started to preach that, people began to come out of the Catholic Church because they seen that that domination of man was not of God. And they began to go among the, the holiness people and the preachers of that uh, grace move that Martin Luther so wonderfully was used of God. Amen. He was used of God. Nobody can deny that. Amen. Amen. Yeah. Back in the, what is, 1700s, when he was bound so in the Catholic Church that you couldn't even have a Bible on your coffee table. But the only Bible was chained in the church and it was written in Latin so that not anybody else could understand what was read. The only man they could take doctrine from was the priest that ruled over them. God anointed Martin Luther. Glory be to God. Hallelujah. And one day under the Spirit's leading, he wrote his 96 thesis that faith and grace alone justified a man in the eyes of God. Amen. Not communion, not drinking wine, right. not confessions, not lighting candles, yeah. but the pure faith and grace of God yes. caused a man to be changed into a new creature. Yes. And he marched across town in Wittenberg, Germany, and nailed his thesis on the door of the Catholic Church, somebody say praise the Lord, and started the great reformation. The change that set it all in motion. That man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. Hallelujah! And there had been a transition through that time of uh, Wesley's and Cartwright, Peter Cartwright, and all of these guys' names that came through that time began to preach us further into the revelation. Pentecost hit this nation in the turn of the century, in the 1900s. Glory to God. When in Topeka, Kansas, it fell in Parham's Mansion on the rooftop of a bunch of Bible school kids. And about the same time, it fell on the east coast in the hills of Carolina with A.J. Thomason. And then it fell about the same time on the west coast in a horse stable in Los Angeles, California on Azusa Street when William J. Seymour, hallelujah, uh, opened up his apostolic mission and the Holy Ghost baptized them believers, hallelujah to God. And they, out of that came the preaching.
revelation and the revelation to the people of the oneness of God. Hallelujah. Of course, they all got away from that, but we're going, we're we're out there this morning. Amen. We know who he is. Amen. Jesus is God Almighty. Amen. And so all of that was beautiful and wonderful. What I'm trying to tell you is up until the 1830s, no preacher in any generation ever preached that God didn't believe his saints could overcome. They never preached that God was just looking for a way to snatch us all out of here so that he could punish everybody that was left in the earth. But when these brethren came against the Catholic Church publicly, Cardinal Rivera wrote his book and began the teaching of of a secret rapture where we're stolen out of here. I'm preaching better than you're shouting now. I'm not asking you to believe me, but I do ask you to believe, hallelujah, in a God who is big enough and good enough and bad enough to cause you to be what He spoke over you and manifested in this earth. Praise the Lord. Then right about that time to support the theory, this is getting too boring for you. Let me know and I'll tell you. But right about the time to support that theory, there was a little old girl in Scotland. And she went out in a meeting and she had a vision. And in that vision she saw herself running through these clovers and saw this city. And I don't doubt the girl saw anything. Hello. I'm not saying that. Although she was known to have epilepsy and constantly went into raging fevers where she talked out of her head and I'll say that and that's all I'll say. And then after that, the vision was passed on and Rivera and all the rest of them got a hold of it and they published the first Catholic manuscript. Hallelujah. On the millennial and kingdom and all of this stuff. And it began to fly because the Plymouth Brethren Embrace such a doctrine and when the Plymouth brethren embraced it there was a man among them named John Alexander Darby and Darby invented the teaching of dispensationalism and said that God was so weary and mad with this earth and the people in it that he had to get the saints out of here so he could kill off everybody. This is what they're teaching in Pentecostal churches. Yes. Amen. Lord, I'm talking history and feeling God. That don't happen too much, but I am. Glory. Because I know I'm telling you the truth. <laughs> you people that listen to us and criticize us, why don't you come over here and find out what we teach? You don't know what we teach. You just know what somebody on the corner in the drugstore mouths off to you. All you participate in is idle gossip. You don't know nothing about it. Bring yourself. We welcome you to come and hear the word of the Lord. Hallelujah. All right. was said and done. They got all their books wrote. Darby come over and had his notes. But Darby didn't have the means to publish it so far. Then C.I. Schofield got a hold of it. And do you know there are still preachers in this country and in Pentecost that think if you ain't got a C.I. Schofield Bible, you can't preach. Right. Right. And Schofield's notes ain't even original. He plagiarized Darby's notes on dispensationalism. And you'll love this. He didn't have the money to produce the copies of the notes in the Bible. But he found a bunch of Freemasons. Yes. <laughs> come on, ring a ling a ling a ling a ling. They come. Get that. He found a group of Freemasons who were more than willing to fund such a production. And so that precious Schofield Bible you're told under your arm and judge everybody with including your own flesh and blood relative when the Bible teaches you that if you're saved, your whole house is going. Yes. Glory! Yes. Woo! Glory to God! You're running around peddling sloth that was plagiarized and funded by the Freemasons telling you God's going to kill off everybody. Are you hearing me, church? I don't advise you going down and sit on by the stop sign every day. You may not have too many friends, but Lord know what you believe, folks, and know why you believe. And so when all was said and done, they got Larkin to draw up the charts for it, and Brother Varner said Larkin was just an out-of-work architect that needed quick pay, and he produced a book called I've Got It in My Library and Most Other Preachers Do. 
Sensational Truths is the name of that book. It'll teach you page by page how God's plan is that He's got one little group He loves, but the other little group He's been mad at for an eternity. And as soon as He can get us all wound up and hide us away, He's going to kill that other bunch. Now, be honest with me. How many of you most of your life, that is the end time doctrine that you've been taught. Say amen. amen. And did it not produce fear and strife and a feeling of unworthiness and unacceptance unto God. Making you feel like even when you prayed, you wasn't praying good enough. Even when you worshiped God, you wasn't doing it good enough. And that even if there were a flying away, you wouldn't go in it. Because how could you be worthy enough Amen. to be part of that little itty bitty speck? That's right. Come on. Oh Lord. That's right. Nobody here but us chickens, I guess, today. <laughs> we can talk what we want to, can't we? Oh. And so this is this is where it all this is what it all amounts to. Brother Darby went, I mean Larkin went too far in his manuscript. He published in that dispensational truth manuscript. And any such manifestations of the Holy Ghost, such as dancing in the Spirit, prophetic utterance, tongues and interpretation, falling out under the power of God, was in his interpretation the marks of demonism. Yes. And so we find out the truth. The Assemblies of God, Church of God, Pentecostal Holies, uh, a Free Church of God, Bound Church, whatever the title is, <laughs> Brother Hall said, One God, Two God, No God Churches, all of them together. We're teaching a doctrine by a man who didn't even believe in the Pentecostal experience. He didn't believe in tongues. He didn't believe in interpretation. He didn't believe in dancing. And yet for a decade, we had, or a decade, a century, we had taken our eschatological views from one who was not even baptized in the Holy Ghost so he couldn't have got no revelation from God. And he who not only wasn't baptized but declared we who were were more or less demon-possessed. Their whole theory bases in a big shift, and the shift is, at the end of Revelation 3, the church is out of here. Finito, gone. Man, you understand that? I, I wouldn't mind them going so bad if they knew they was coming right back, but they don't believe they're coming right back. No. No, no, they can't come back. How can they come back? God hates everybody. God hates the earth. God's mad at everybody. He's going to kill them all. Yeah. I want you to know that ain't the kind of God I serve. Amen. 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 I'm to say God knows what love is. It doesn't yeah. say that He can talk about love. It doesn't say He can sing about love. It says He is love. Yes. All right. Oh, God have mercy. You, That'll make you feel better than the grave. You won't it? Amen. Oh, yeah. and, then, and then they teach that after the fourth, this is what the whole lineage of dispensationalism hinges on. That after the fourth chapter of the book of Revelation in the first verse, they ain't no more mention of the church in the book of Revelation. Their whole theory is based on that. Boy, if you prove that we're on the whole wall, brother, and we can prove it wrong, well, what we're getting into now. Where did all this multitude come from that no man could number? If there were no saints in the earth, why did the Lord say go seal them all? Yes. In the forehead. <laughs> I'm just asking. I'm not, I'm not. I'm just asking. Now here's the beauty of what made us come to this day when we are called. I know what the thought is. Well, how did we come to this knowledge of the truth? Well, I'll tell you how. At the turn of the century, there was a major, major breakup going on in the mid mid Midwest and the West West. <coughs> they were arguing over many things. One of them was the oneness of God. Oh, they just couldn't handle Jesus being God. They had to embrace and adopt a three God mentality, which they did. But here was the thing: there was a group of men that had been in those denominations. Among these noble men were men like George Halton, George Warnock, and Bill Britton. Thank God for Brother Britton. And while they were sitting around the table one day, God had been dealing with them all, telling them it wasn't right. There was something deeper. That that was Babylonianism. And God was calling them out of that realm. 
and Brother Britton and these other brothers, and I want you to know some. Some of them were loud and boisterous brethren, but there were men among them like Brother, uh, like, like Brother Warnock. They were so gentle they never lifted their voice for nothing. But they said, "We will not allow somebody that doesn't even have the Holy Ghost to dictate to us how we're going to believe about end time events." And with that said, God birthed that day in that little room in the forties. Hallelujah. Oh, around that long table with those men who God had been dealing with to come out of them and be separate. He birthed what we know as the latter rain movement. Hallelujah! By that time in Pentecostal churches there was no land on their hands. There was no prophecy anymore. The gifts were almost obsolete because of the war that had been among the brethren. But the minute God birthed the latter rain move in that room that day, a prophecy began to happen. Oh, miracles began to happen. Signs and wonders began to happen. And whether they ever embraced it or not, there would have never been the healing revival of the 50s and the 60s had not these men got along with God and allowed Him to birth a new revelation in their heart. Amen. So I ask you this morning, and I say to you all I ask you, I'll ask and answer in the same line. Number one, hallelujah, is God a respect for a person? No, He's not. Does God deal by dispensations? No, He does not. What is a dispensation? Is it in the Bible? Yes, two times. Hallelujah. The book of Ephesians talks about the dispensation of the fullness of time. But if you look up the word dispensation, it's got nothing to do with just a little period or hour of time that's going to run out. But it means somebody who's been designated to oversee what God is going to do. Hallelujah. It means somebody left with the house. Jesus said, I'm going on a journey and I'm going to leave you over my house. Occupy. Hallelujah. Occupy until I come. Amen. All right. So with that said, John said, oh, glory to God. I preached all my time out on that. Didn't even get my scriptures. Started. How many believes the Lord speaking to us? Glory! Yeah, and how many understand that when we preachers are different ones exhorting or get up and say anything and we flat out say that we don't believe in such things as what I said, it's not so we can start an argument. And it's not just to come against somebody. But it's because we have literally studied this stuff out not only through the scriptures but through the histories of time. And found out that this doctrine was not preached until the 1830s. Hello, church. And you say, well, why didn't anybody else know it? Well, my biggest theory is they're afraid to know it. They are afraid to go find out because it might not be the way they think it is. And if it wasn't, they got too much pride. Right. To get up and tell their people that they believe God's got something better for them. That's right. Hello, glory, church. Glory, glory. I want to settle once and for all. You ain't serving God so you can get out of here. <laughs> You're serving Him because He's transforming you into His image and into His life. And the only escape that you've needed, you've already had. You yes. escaped death. Glory. You escaped judgment. Yes. You escaped wrath. Glory. Didn't you do it? All right, now let's get... <laughs> he sees four angels that are standing on, and they have the four winds of the earth. Right? And uh, the Lord begins to tell them that He don't want that wind blowing uh, on the earth or the sea or the trees. Now the earth realm is the flesh realm. The sea realm is the soul realm. Right? And we covered all of that. And the uh, uh, trees is people, of course. Good God, you all know that by now. The trees is people. Right? And the Lord says, I don't want you to hurt the earth. And I don't want you to hurt the sea. And I don't want you to hurt the trees. Right? Until you go forth and seal the saints of God in their foreheads. Right? He said, I want you to see them in their foreheads. All right. 
That's 7 and 3 where he says that. Now let's preach just a little bit right here and we'll close and go home and eat and come back tonight. Praise the Lord. But what I want you to see first of all is, as I just said, if all the church is out of here, I just want you to think these things through. If all the saints are gone, if they've all went in a flying away scene, and there ain't no more saints here, because see what the furthest, I didn't get into some of that, but I'll give you a good overhaul of it, a quick, quick uh, crash course, they call it. They have fast. But what I want to say was they also believe that the minute the saints are gone, the Holy Ghost leaves the earth. Remember that? Well, that's impossible. Jesus said, I'll never leave you. I'll never forsake you. But they say you don't forsake them all. And of course, they get that teaching from Thessalonians where Paul says the man of sin will be revealed. The man of sin is the carnal man. The carnal man. And he said, whom God will destroy the spirit of his mouth and the brightness of his coming. Whose work is wrapped to the line wanders of Satan. And then he said that he who led it will let till he be taken out of the way. They believe that he that be taken out of the way is the Holy Ghost. Well, that's dumb. The he in question there is not the Holy Ghost. It's the man of sin. So who's going to be took away? That flesh is. That right. It's going to be thrown him. He's going to remove him. Hallelujah. And they're going to tar and feather me, I imagine. But I'm telling you the truth. Glory. Anyway. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Well, glory. Now let me say, say something here. What business did the Lord got telling these angels, which are messengers, somebody's going to go preach. And they're teaching us and God's hanging right on the battle just waiting to, to, to destroy everybody. And He's telling them not to destroy. Hold it back. Hold it back. Well, now I want you to get it clear that first of all, He's not coming to destroy natural earth. Right. Ain't nothing wrong with the earth. Hallelujah. Ain't a lot of things wrong with the thinking that's on the earth. But ain't nothing wrong with the earth itself. The earth is the Lord's and the fullness of earth. Amen. Ain't nothing wrong with ain't nothing wrong with the state of Florida. It's contrary to what Brother Terrell says, it's not going to break off the map and flow down in a storm somewhere. Somebody say, man. Nothing wrong with the state. Nothing, nothing wrong with the United States, and as far as its land and, and, and such. The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. The only thing that that has tainted and, and stained up things is that carnal mind in men yes. that thinks evil. And God's coming to judge it and destroy it. What is He coming to judge and destroy? The iniquity. God don't hate the sinner. He hates the sin. Right. But He took the sin. Yeah. And nailed it to the tree. And nobody ain't never told them that. Right. They're believing a lie. And being damned. Because they don't know that he's took the sin. So they believe they still have to live under the power of it. But if the right message of the gospel of the kingdom is preached to these people, they'll be told, you don't have to carry that sin no more. Jesus already reconciled you in Calvary's cross. Right. And suddenly their understanding becomes quickened. And that, oh, glory to God. They're born again, not because they repeated a prayer or read a tract, but because they're born again by the Spirit of God on the inside. Right. Of them. Amen. And that good preaching this morning. Right. And they're resurrected up and they believe in Him. So is God coming to blow these winds upon the natural earth, the, the, the atmospheric earth? No. He's blowing all right. He's blowing out all them concepts, imaginations, falsehoods, thoughts that have kept you back, things that have hindered you, troublesome ways. You could empty every prison in this United States with totally justified, reformed inmates if they only had a change of mind. Somebody say praise the Lord. Glory to God. Hallelujah. Isn't that the word? this morning and so the, he said hold back hold on don't you turn that wind loose what for because I'm going down there and seal the saints of the living God in their forehead wait a minute Darby and Larkin and them said that there ain't no saints here no more there ain't no church here no more there ain't any believers here anymore well my Lord somebody better tell heaven that there ain't no saints around because heaven said I got a multitude that no man can number. I've got a host. I've got a people. Hallelujah. I've got a people in my image, in my likeness, in my nature, in my name. Hallelujah. The Lord knows them that are his. Hallelujah.
all saints in this earth, even after you think we're all, they're all gone, God's got a people. God's got a house. God's got a church. God's got a name.
And whether you even can receive it or not, there's some written in there that you wouldn't think to stand a chance. But bless your heart, God ain't going to ask you about it. He's already sealed it. Glory. I mean, some of them you won't like this. You'll get some mad at before. Some of them's probably laying dog drop somewhere right now. Don't even know what their name is. And the Lord's already sealed them. And bless God, just save you ink and don't carry them no box of tracks. And don't, glory to God, don't go over yonder and try to drag them in on a sled. Just, uh -huh. do you believe in the Lord's power? If you do, you go ahead. Go ahead and walk your walk and live your life. Lord. And don't worry about it. Because if Amen. I read my Bible right, they're sealed unto the day of redemption. Lord. Sealed. We'll talk about that when we start out tonight. Three seals on the high priest. He's sealed on his breastplate. Glory to God. Baptized in the wonderful name of Jesus He's sealed with the two black onyx stones are baptized in the precious Holy Ghost. But he's also sealed in that forehead with the mind of Christ. Amen. Hallelujah. All Ishmael is is a product of Sarah's head and Abraham's right hand. Yeah. Hello. But if the mind of Christ <clears throat> takes you over, you won't even think about it. You'll just do it. Lord. And it'll happen. Every time. Because you think like He thinks. And if you think like God thinks, then you'll work in the Word of Wisdom and the Word of Knowledge and discerning of spirits. And all them spirits you discern won't be demon spirits. You'll be able to discern the Holy Ghost. And say amen. In fact, business, if your discernment is for demons, Please don't discern here. We don't have no demons in here. He ain't in this world, I'll tell you that. He ain't in this realm. So if you've seen any, I'd suggest checking the mirror before you decide who in here has got one because there wasn't one around until you started discerning. Amen. We don't have all of that. We're out of that realm. We don't have all that mouth foaming in growing up and all that stuff. We're out of that. We're, we've been translated out of the darkness into the kingdom. Glory. His dear son. I don't know what else do we. I'm so happy. I'm just bubbling over. You can't wait to get back and see what else. Glory. Amen. 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 You be blessed as you go. Glory. Hallelujah, Jesus. Hallelujah.